Hello there, viewers, listeners, and friends. Uh, welcome back to the Star Trek Hit or Miss podcast, where even when the world's gone to pot, you can hopefully just spend an hour and a half to two hours or so uh, just re reviewing all things Trek with the uh, fellow Trekkies here and just having a good time and uh, enjoying yourself. And to do that, we are this week, as you can probably see on the screen here, we're reviewing an episode of the original series, uh, our first actually official uh, episode of TOS since... Last season's episode we reviewed was The Cage, the unaired pilot. So this is the first time we'll be visiting the proper Kirk and, Kirk and Co. crew uh, to do that. But uh, couldn't do it on my own. So I'm joined by a returning guest from last season. And uh, I'm going to let him introduce himself now. <laughs> Hello, uh, it's Rick Everson of the Ten Backward Podcast. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, Rick, uh, Rick joined me last series to... Uh, discussed the Deep Space Nine pilot emissary. It was a really good review, uh, if I do say so myself. So <laughs> that was good. And I know that uh, you're obviously a fan of all things Trek. So yeah. it's good, good, good. And uh, how are you feeling today? <laughs> yes, yes, good, good. Um, really happy actually to be talking some um, original series. Um, yes. Yeah. The, the first sort of Kirk and Co one, that's quite, that's quite a cool one to be on for the first time. Yeah, it's bizarre it just hasn't come up, because I said the uh, last series, um, I introduced my friend Will to his very first episode, and he wanted to start from the very beginning, so he went with the cage, so it was uh, Captain Pike and Spock we were looking at last series, so yeah. Um, yeah anyway, um, so as you know, you know the drill, because you've been on the podcast before, but it breaks down into sections, I'll go through them for any new listeners as we hit them, um, but the very first section that I want to hit is a section that I call Healing Frequencies Open. Healing frequencies open, sir. Excuse me. Um, yeah, so uh, basically, um, you were on already in the last series, so we've already discussed, and I would highly recommend people to go back and listen to that, your kind of Trek favourites, how you first uh, got interested in Star Trek, the yeah. first things you watched, some cool kind of cosplay stories and things that I recall that we got into, um, which was really good, but... It also leaves uh, me having to find new things this series for any returning guests, uh, just for this first section, and to, to kind of throw questions that are hopefully a surprise on some <laughs> slightly unprepared guests. So this time around, um, I was wanting to know if you could tell me your top three characters from everywhere in the Star Trek franchise, and a little bit of reason why. Oh, right. Um, okay. So uh, this is, I've been getting the question a lot from my little boy now. He's got into Star Trek oh, really? Prime Prodigy. So, oh, um, awesome. So he's frequently saying, oh, who are the best characters? Who's the, and I'm like, <laughs> oh, do, do you know what? It, it depends on my mood. But um, as a general rule, always Commander Riker. Uh, right. So I, I just really have liked Riker ever since I was a kid watching Next Generation. So... Um, yeah, it's it, his his character is kind of this. I just quite like the whole thing about he's almost like a captain in training, which I really mm. enjoyed. Um, and it's been it's it's, it's been my um, my thing that I've really have wanted to meet Jonathan Frakes, but every convention I've been to, he's pulled out at the last minute. Oh, never. <laughs> I know. Oh, which I appreciate. You know, he's uh, very busy with his directing and everything. So you know, he's got to go, yeah. he's, got to, he's got to go with the work, hasn't he? So. But uh, yeah, one day, one, one day I'm going to catch up with him somehow. Let's hope, uh, yeah. <laughs> Weirdly enough, I was seeing just today on Twitter that um, Marina Sirtis has had to cancel an appearance at a convention in Germany because she's working. And I'm keeping oh. my fingers crossed that's for some perhaps last minute Star Trek Picard filming or something. But uh, oh, we'll, see. <laughs> we'll see. We'll uh, see. Mm. Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah. so yeah, the first one is uh, is Riker. Uh, possibly yeah. for the the obvious reasons, the kind of he's he's the most kind of square jawed hero, I think, of the the next gen era. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think, and that that obviously appealed to me as uh, when I was sort of first getting into it. So yeah, and, uh, uh, that's cool. So you uh, obviously enjoyed his appearances in the newer stuff. Obviously, when the Titan swooped in during Lower Dex's uh, season oh one, my word. it was incredible. <laughs> I was just so excited <laughs> when that yeah. happened. I was like, oh no way! Ah, oh, they've got Riker because I think with Picard. We'd obviously all knew that Riker was going to show up, but the mm. Lower Decks one was an absolute surprise to me. 
So yeah, I was baffled when I heard that they weren't going to do that last minute thing with Riker in Picard season one. Uh, that it was kind of a late addition because I was like, that is probably the best scene of the series. Uh, the Zheng He, which I'm staring at the model of right here, kind of swooping in and Captain Riker just stealing the show in a couple of lines of like, yo, I just want to kick your Romulan butt. And <laughs> just, yeah, yeah, oh, very good. So, good. Yes. <laughs> so uh, that's fair enough for number one. What about your, your number two out of the three then? Uh, Tuvok. Without a doubt, Tuvok. I Ooh, love Tuvok, yeah. Um, just everything about him is brilliant. He's, um, I think Tim Russ plays him amazingly. Um, he's just got the, all the all the beautiful logic thing, but he's got the dry humour. His, <laughs> his his kind of tolerance of Neelix, but it's underneath is actually a real friendship there. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's a heart that heartbreaking moment when he gives Neelix the dance by wiggling his foot at him in Neelix's last episode. It's just yes, oh. That's so sweet. Mm. Yeah. Um, and at the just, yeah, it's just some of my favourite um, episodes are, are very Tuvok heavy. I, I really like Learning Curve, where he's having to train the Marquis yeah, in, yeah. And to be Starfleet. Um, Innocence, where he's trapped on the planet with uh, what seem to be children. It's one of my all-time favourite mm -hmm. voyages. I yeah, I remember that one. I also personally really love the episode Gravity, because it's, uh, it's a very mm. unexpected kind of um, view of the whole Vulcan thing of like, you know, it's not that we don't have emotions, it's that when we do, we have to really yeah. repress them, and we've never seen that struggle on that level before. Um, exactly, and, so, yeah. and how good is he in Meld when he's done the Meld with Lars well, yes. Suda? And you've oh, got yes. dark dark terrifying Tuvok is like whoa yeah. so. um, unfortunately the last Voyager episode I watched for the podcast which just went up recently was um, an episode that did Tuvok dirty it was going to Matrix Zero where it's kind of like oh dear yeah yeah <laughs> I, was, yeah I was a bit disappointed in uh, yeah I think as you say they did him dirty in that one a little bit didn't they yeah fully yeah. assimilated only to have it completely forgotten the following week and just never addressed again so yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Um, I was really fortunate, actually, got to meet Tim Russ um, a few years back when he came to a um, a little a sci-fi event, actually in my hometown of Lincoln, which uh, oh. was incredible because very little goes on in Lincoln. We're not that big a city, so to get someone that was, when I found out Tim Russ was going to be, I was like, "What? That's amazing!" Um, awesome. I was, so I was, I was, um, I'd gone with two of my co-hosts from Ten Backward, and I was right there in the queue to get get my photo taken with him um yeah. so i was number two in the queue um and people starting to get a little bit where is he what's he doing and they looked over and he's still at his autograph table although he's supposed to have moved over and they're like oh who are those two holding him up i was like yeah they're my co-hosts <sighs> mm -hmm. um apparently they'd asked him about working with um <laughs> with brad Dourif, who played lon yes, and he'd legend. gone off onto he'd gone off onto an epic thing i think about um I can't remember which film, some some sort of lesser known film of, of uh, Brad Dourif's for ages, um, to the point that everyone's getting a little bit annoyed with why he's being so late, and I'm just there going, yeah, those that's my friend's fault. <laughs> <laughs> well, given that you said lesser known film, I'm guessing it wasn't one of the Chucky Child's Play films he was talking about. No, it was, it was, it was, was it? I think it was Ch Child's Play 3. Oh, okay. That was enough. it, yeah, Child's Play 3, yeah. So, um... <laughs> But then enough, he did. Yeah. He did. He did come over. He did his first photo, and then it's my go. So I go up. I stand with him, uh, and he's put his arm around my shoulders. I put my arm around him, and the camera jams. And this, this photographer's like stood there. Like he's trying to say, "Oh, sorry about this. Just working out." So I'm just stood there, arm in arm with Tuvok, and I'm thinking, <laughs> "That's fine. This is amazing. This is the best moment." I'm just. I'm basically hugging Tuvok, and then I thought, "Oh God, I'm Neelix." <laughs> <laughs> You know, what What would make this story perfect is if I find out that you did the same as you did with um, the guy who played uh, Martok, um, whose name escapes me right now, and you dressed as his, uh, like, lesser-known cosplay. Oh. So you, you went to meet Tim Russ and you were like, I'm the terrorist from Starship Mine. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been a brilliant one. Huh? I think I think I was... <laughs> As I recall, I was in a Kelvinverse uniform top, so not mm. quite as good, but... Yeah, That's that a shame. Brilliant. Or you could have also went with the lieutenant on the Enterprise B, of course, <laughs> from Generation. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's sad. Really weird when you think Tuvok was on the Excelsior at the same exact time. <laughs> like, I know. That always throws me a little bit. It's like... Yeah. Is that guy supposed to be Tuvok? Nope. He's not got Vulcan ears, so... Yeah. It's just like, yeah. we, we, were you two at the Academy together? Because that must have been really <laughs> confusing. Exactly, yeah. 
<laughs> oh well. Um, and what about your third, uh, third and final choice then of, of best characters? Uh, ben Cisco, I think. Yeah, fair um, choice. <laughs> I, yeah, just absolutely love Cisco. Fantastic. Um, the way yeah you know, his growth throughout Deep Space Nine. Well, you know, all of Deep Space Nine is so so good. Um, mm. And yeah, so his his growth through that it's brilliant because you kind of like. Is, is this officer taking on this thing and he, the way he has to grow and end up basically leading a war um, mm-hmm. as well as dealing with being a sort of inadvertent religious figure. It's just just incredible stuff. Um, so I always, always enjoyed that. I think um, one of the first times I ever guested on another podcast was on Trek Ranks and that was a uh, top five Ben Sisko moments. So that was a Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was so up my street, that one. I would loved it. Hard to narrow down, I would have thought. <laughs> it was, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, yeah, I think that would be, that'd be Sisko. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's uh, difficult to see it, considering how many great uh, people there have been in the Trek universe, but he may be the best acted character, I think, in all of the, the franchise up to now. Yes, but, yeah. yeah. Well, certainly, you know, as a, as a, in later years, as I've become a father... It's like mm. as, as you look back at Star Trek, well, a good model there is definitely Cisco, yeah. um, not Worf, but for sure. That's, uh... Well, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's pretty bad when it comes to that, really. When you think, uh, fair God, enough, yeah. um, well, that's yeah. cool. No, I, I like Cisco. I got frustrated at a couple of the plot lines. I'm really not a fan of the whole drawing the Romulans into the war by illegal means thing, even though everyone else seems to love that. Um, and yeah, and I don't like the um, I don't like his ending. Again, uh, just having him flit off to the wormhole and be like, "I'll, I'll be back at some point." So, oh mm. dear, that's that's a little unsatisfying, <laughs> especially with yeah. a new child on the way. It's not the best look, is it really? But, uh, no, no. But um, well, I mean, I suppose the the alternative is he w- he would have perished fighting Descartes. So yeah, I guess. But uh, anyway, plus to be honest, I just didn't like that whole idea that they introduced in the seventh season about no, no, your mum was an actual prophet and your birth's <laughs> preordained and so forth. Like, now, now we're getting silly. <laughs> I could live without this. But no, there's a lot of, uh, to, to give you the other side of that, there's a lot of great moments. And yeah. one of my favorite moments in the Trek franchise is the end of um, Rocks and Shoals when he kind of has to reluctantly accept the voters' intelligence and just wipe yeah. out the Jem'Hadar. And it's like, um, it's it's not fair that you have to do this to the, the first of the Jem'Hadar. And he's like, well, it's not about what's fair. It's, you know, this, these are the people I serve. It's my, the way of my life. Mm. And uh, Cisco just absolutely hating that he has to do it. And then the sheer vitriol when the voter guy comes who's getting taken as a prisoner of war. And you can see he's fighting against every instinct to just shoot him. He's yeah. Like, oh, chief, take this guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but that I mean that's one of the things that does really well is is to betray that the the hard choices that uh, War has bought and placed on Cisco. I think. Definitely. So, yeah. Uh, Plus, obviously, can't really not mention far beyond the stars and just say that there's nothing to see except perfection. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Awesome. But that's the that's oh. the beauty of his range as well. Because um, one of my favourite moments is the end of Bada Bing Bada Bang, where he sings with Vic. <laughs> oh yes, so, definitely. And so, if, we're, if we're talking about weird and varied range, I mentioned this. Um, I can't remember why it came up, but I think a couple of weeks ago I mentioned how good is he as the weird supervillain in the Bashir Hollow program in oh um, Our Man Bashir. It's clearly <laughs> it's a powerhouse time performance. Of his... <laughs> he's enjoying that, you can tell. <laughs> yeah. Oh, definitely. But he's so good at it as well. And it's like, mm. where did this come from? Yeah, yeah. getting to play the, uh, the supervillain instead of the hero. you got to love it. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Um, oh, that's fair enough. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, that's your top three then. So Juvok, yep. Ben Cisco, and uh, Will Riker. Good little lineup, not bad. So, yeah, <laughs> fair enough. Uh, well, I'll move us on to the next section then, because it's a section I know you've been looking forward to. You know, from the last time you were here. Um, in case yeah. any uh, new viewers are unaware, uh, basically I just throw random things from the Star Trek universe at Rick that he hasn't heard before, ask him if he thinks they're a hit or a miss, and uh, see if we agree or disagree. And so, yes, this is the section that gives the podcast its name. It's the hit or miss section. What about my performance? I'm not a drama critic. So, you all set to uh, for these ones then? <laughs> I am, yes. Yeah. Awesome. So the very first thing I have on my list for this week then is the Next Generation two-parter, Descent. Uh, is it a hit or a miss for you? Oh, brilliant. Um, coincidentally, um, we not long back did a um, episode of 10 Backward where we covered Descent. So oh, okay, this cool. one's quite, quite fresh in my mind. Um, I think right. um, I, I think it's a hit. Um, and, you know, I haven't always thought that. 
Um, okay. For a long time, I thought that it kind of basically ruined the Borg, but I kind of actually these days more appreciate that that I Borg and Descent give us quite a different take on it all. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I would say hits. Um, I think I think there's a lot of good stuff in Descent. You have the the opening bit with um, Data's poker game mm. with uh, Hawking, Newton, and um, Einstein. Um, and it's brilliant. It's one of those things. Well, actually, you know what the holodeck would be good for? That that oft que um, used question: Who would you have a dinner party with? Figures from yeah, history. So that's that's essentially what kind of amusing the bickering that's going on, isn't it? With um, them yeah. saying like, that's, "Sorry, Newton, we believed that story to be apocryphal. How dare you!" And, uh, <laughs> yeah. and Hawking saying to like, uh, "All the quantum fluctuations in the universe can't change your hand." If I'm wrong again, Albert. <laughs> <You know>? Yeah. <laughs> I like uh, it. Yeah. Um, um, I'm, yeah, and then I'm a, the, the Borg thing when they come in, that's that's quite a scary moment. You get into a firefight. So, you know, I think yeah. after Best of Both Worlds, what could you do with the Borg without sort of rehashing yeah. a lot of stuff? I think that, that but Next Gen obviously would re really recognise the danger that if you overuse them mm. uh, without a good story thing behind it, then that you are potentially going to dampen them or dilute them. Yeah. Um, so I think what they did with this is was a fairly brave attempt to say, what if what if this hive mind culture found individuality, um, and then what if Data's evil twin took advantage of that? Uh, <laughs> yeah, so. exactly. I I think the episode's good. I think from the start mm. it basically it more or less announces to you this isn't every Borg. This is just a kind of a splinter cell, I guess, of of the ones that Hugh has infected. Uh, which is why it works perfectly, as you say. It really only works, in fact, in concert with iBorg. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess you have to have some knowledge of law, so maybe data law or something as well. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I like it. I think it was... I remember the time I was watching it, I was really shocked at the kind of... the little things, like Data losing his calm on, on one of the Borg and the Borg yeah. clearly showing individuality and, and having, like, uh, you know, emotions and identities and names and stuff. And I was really intrigued by the mystery of it all the first time around, but then... Yeah, um, and as a bonus, yeah. it features the um, Power Rangers Command Center in that episode. So. <laughs> yes. yeah. yeah, yeah, whatever that building is in um, California somewhere. <laughs> um, Very weird. I, I mean, I'd also, even if they absolutely just wrecked the whole Borg storyline through the whole thing, I would still rate it highly because of the um, Crusher and Command story. Oh, that was good. Apart from yeah. the use of those solar shields, which was a weird callback to an episode I didn't like. Oh, <laughs> I suppose see, that kind of justifies that. <laughs> I absolutely adore Suspicions. It's, I oh, well, fair of, enough. It's, it's, it's um, I'd, uh, what, I would say it's, it's been one of my most controversial favourites because I know it's not popular, but I, I really love it. That's fair uh, enough. That's okay. Um, no, I, I had forgotten about that, but I love the bit as well when the... Um, I wish I could remember their names, but the Ensign... The sort of female Tate. ensign puts um, puts James Horan's character in his place completely as well. <laughs> yes, yeah. I just have to make sure my calculations are accurate, Lieutenant. Um, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's a nice touch actually that um, James Horan plays the lieutenant there, but he also played Jabril in Suspicions, who tried to steal mm. the uh, solar shield tech. He did. I remember, and he got so angry that he decided to travel to the future and then try to manipulate the solar barn later. <laughs> oh, he did, didn't he? Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, he was future guy's voice as well for a yeah. while, despite um, Beverly blasting a hole through him. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, um, no, that was cool. So I'm, I'm assuming, by the way, you probably know the story about what happened when um, when Hawking visited the Enterprise D engineer and when Stephen Hawking oh. was starring. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so he's working on that. Yeah, that was the one. <laughs> Walked yeah. past the warp core. I'm working on that. I went past it and said, "Yeah, I see." <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, nice touch. I thought that was that was always one of those heartwarming stories that I enjoyed hearing. But yeah, it's mm, weird when you think yeah. big guest star to get in for just your pre-credit scene, isn't it? Really? <laughs> but, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. But yeah, I think we both like uh, Descent then as a story. Mm, absolutely, hit for me. I need to uh, I need to give it another watch. It's been a while, but uh, it's not come up this series on the Borg list. But you know, maybe next time. Uh, I'll move to the next one. Then it's another episode. Uh, it's an episode of Voyager. Uh, hit or miss for the episode Dreadnought. Um, I'm going to say hit. Uh, mm -hmm. I like Dreadnought. I, I was always a big fan of Bellana Torres anyway. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I quite enjoyed that um, because uh, Bellana as a character, I think, has, has quite a, a, a sharp growth 
once she becomes chief engineer and starts to settle mm. into that. So it's good. It it was quite good to have her suddenly confronted with this thing that she'd done, which you know she'd done uh, fully in in line with all her marquee thing. But suddenly to have mm. it here and it's going to destroy a planet full of people um, who have got nothing to do with the uh, the marquee conflict, um, and for her to then sort of it's it's, it's essentially it's a good sort of. 20, 30 minutes of her arguing with herself. Yeah, I suppose, yeah, because that's the voice. Yeah, I mean, I like that they did that. It's, it's quite good TV because, you know, it's... Um, that's the great thing about Blanta is, is she is someone who is constantly sort of at war with herself between a human and Klingon sides. Yeah, I never put so that together, kinda, but I suppose you're right, yeah. Yeah, we take that into a sort of almost a more literal thing. There's like, now she's going to basically argue with a computerized version of herself so yeah. awesome yeah fair enough yeah that's good i would say the same it's i just really like that episode i think it's a hit because i think it's one of the it's one of the most tightly plotted like 45 minutes of trek i think that they've done it there's a real sense of tension throughout it um yeah you always know when it's main characters they're going to be fine but somehow in that case i was very much like it really feels like anything could happen. You know, Balana could end up de uh, dead. One of these planets could wind up destroyed. There's real stakes and there's tension and I'm sweating it. And uh, mm -hmm. as you say, the sheer cleverness of why it was, you know, why all these fail safes were in place and she was trying to out outwit this computer, I guess, in a way that uh, Captain Kirk would probably have been proud of. <laughs> 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 as we'll see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a great episode. Very well acted as well. I mean, as you say, it's... Yeah. It's essentially Roxanne Dawson for almost the entire thing, just playing off herself as well. So, yeah. very good. Yeah. That's all right then. That's good. <laughs> Another hit. So, yeah. I'll move us on then just to get a few more in if I can. Uh, the next thing on the list is a fairly common one, and that is the character of Khan Noonien Singh. And by that, I obviously mean the Ricardo Mantelborn version. We're not going to address the Benedict Cumberbatch in the room. <laughs> oh. <laughs> To be fair to to uh, Benedict Cumberbatch, he is the second best car. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I mean that's that's a very very easy hit. Uh, Khan is incredible. Um, okay, I would say I, if anything, I probably prefer his space seed um, mm. appearance. Um, Hasn't aged well. <laughs> I'm afraid to say. Uh, well, I, I, I just. Um, I just think in um, in in Wrath of Khan, mm. he's a little too obsessed with his revenge, uh, and we lose some of the. I think it's Space Seed. He as, as he's he's kind of like, he's quite quiet and reserved as he talks. He's got this sort mm. of menace and confidence, and it's only at a certain point, where basically Spock has needled him, he loses his cool, but you get a sense that you know he's holding so much in. Yeah. Um, Whereas in 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 Rathacon, he's not really holding it in. He's he's, he's stomping around, uh, yeah. yelling that he's going to kill Kirk and stuff. He's don't get me wrong, he's brilliant. I, I love mm. Rathacon, and I think he's great in that. But of the two, I'd probably say um, I prefer Space Seed uh, because he's just he's just creepy and horrible, but also he's charming, and you can kind of totally get why he could seduce many many people to his side to fight this thing and you know convince them of his superiority yeah see that's i would say the opposite because like i said i rewatched space seed recently and was kind of surprised how poorly it kind of has aged like oh. i said i'm sure i'll have some people tutting and like no it's overly woke of you to say this and whatever but there's a level of misogyny in that character and in the script when i rewatched it that i'm really not comfortable with it's very uh, well like, um, there yeah. absolutely is yeah um <laughs> Yeah, um, <laughs> this is one of those things that does crop up when you rewatch some original series. Um, yeah, I mean, it was like... the 60s, but to, to literally effectively say, ooh, this woman has fallen in love because he acted like a man and slapped her around a bit and stuff, and it's like, ooh, is that really somewhere we want to go? <laughs> Do you know what I yeah, mean? I, uh, it's kind of... <laughs> it is It is problematic. His, his treatment yeah. and seduction of MacGyver's is yeah. definitely problematic. Um, which isn't to write the whole thing off. There's some great stuff there, as you say, and there's yeah. some good kind of commentary and, uh, uh, you know, acting off the, the character. Um, to an extent, though, I think it fits, as, even even when you're viewing it in that lens, I still think it, it fits the, 
the, the, the, the natural assumed superiority that he has. Mm. It fits him, but I don't. I just don't buy the twenty third century Starfleet woman would be like, "Oh, you've hit me. I love you so much." Yeah, <laughs> you know yeah. I mean? it's very like. It's uh, disappointing that it, that she's portrayed as, as you know as that it works on her. Yeah, so. exactly. Um, but I mean, like I said, it's it's the backstory and stuff is still very intriguing, and mm -hmm. uh, the scenes where he's playing off Kirk and Spock, and there's a bit of like, did, how did he do this? Was it, what, what was the charm that took over half the world and whatever yeah. and. Uh, yeah, but I would be really intrigued about that because I remember at the time being really kind of annoyed at the, that being the first instance of like, well, Star Trek can't be real because that didn't happen in the 90s. <laughs> you know, we didn't have the eugenics wars and stuff. But uh, are you okay with that? Have you head it into an alternate universe or something? <laughs> yeah, I've got I've got two head cannons. Uh, one is the, there's a series of books. I think Greg Cox wrote these novels. For these I've seen them, yeah. yeah. Um, and they actually do quite a good job of tying them into real world events and right. having it kind of like um, a, an almost like a, a, an unseen war. Right. Um, that by playing through these events and if you string them together in, so that Khan is sort of there, turning these strings, um, the wider world doesn't even realise what he's done. So th I right. think that, that, that's a very brave effort at actually justifying the eugenics wars as a thing that actually happened. But almost you don't see it until you can step back and look at it through uh, as, 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 through history kind of thing. Yeah. Um, my other headcanon is it totally happened, but we were all just watching so much Star Trek we didn't notice. <laughs> Fair enough. No, I've been meaning to check out those books because I have heard they're actually a really good because they do dive, as you say, into kind of the 90s uh, Khan's initial ruling and uh, taking over the Earth and tying some real world events into it. So. Yeah. yeah, so I think we, we both think Khan's a hit, but with a couple of uh, yeah. blind spots, maybe, in my case. But, yeah, on the other side, I love Wrath of Khan because I just I love that it's unashamedly just Moby Dick and he's kind of the Ahab of the story and, yeah. you know, revenge is his undoing and stuff. It's it's very broad and it's not at all subtle, but what the heck. <laughs> and I think he plays that, Ricardo Montalban just plays that brilliantly. And, yeah, uh, yeah. always amazed when you realise that him and Kirk never share a scene together in that movie. Yes. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they, they, yeah, the closest is the, their conversation they have over the view screen. Nice. Exactly. I used that as an argument against holographic communications in the last episode I recorded because I said, I, I get that the people that behind these shows think you need to have person-to-person -person acting for real tension, but Wrath of Khan is a perfect example of why you absolutely don't. You can just yeah. use a view screen if the actors are good enough. So, <laughs> yeah. 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 Anyway, okay, the next thing for today, I'll do a couple more. Then the next thing on the list for today is the Borg probe ship. From Dark Frontier, is it a hit or a miss for you? Um, so the little, that's that's the little one right at the beginning. It's been the, the torpedo yeah, one. How, so. how to describe it? It looks like a torpedo casing or a bullet or something. Mm. Just, I guess yeah. Borg rectangle would be the closest I could get to describing <laughs> it. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, well, th th this is the thing. Um, it hit. I'm going to say hit, uh, mm -hmm. and I think it's good to give us a little bit more range for Borg vehicles, but also. Mm. We kind of need to get to the point where we understand there are Borg ships that it's feasible for Voyager to beat. So, if yeah, a ship the size of Voyager should not feasibly be able to overcome a Borg cube every year. Uh, or even a sphere, as you say, really, yeah. Well, yeah, so, whereas, um, and we're quite specific in first contact that quantum torpedoes are the effective thing, Voyager doesn't have them. Um, yeah. So it's kind of like, well, not that we ever see, and there's no sort of nothing, no. You'd have thought they'd have used them if they did. They so, do have like tricobalt devices and weird things at the start of the the series, though, that we'd never yeah, heard of was, before. Yeah, those 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 seem quite destructive. And yeah, they destroyed the caretakers array. <laughs> might not carry many of them. But, uh, but yeah, the um, I th so I think it's good that we we have a range of Borg ships that you can um, feasibly have Voyager overcome. I quite like that it wasn't just a straight uh, pew pew shoot it out and. Voyager wins there. We I liked how to... cleverly it was defeated, actually. I thought that was really yeah. ingenious in a weird sort of way. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, and also, I, my, my assumption, my headcanon, is that that is the kind of same sort of small-scale scout ship that he was on. So... Oh, I never thought of that. Yeah, I guess it could be. Yeah, because he was supposed to have been off of a very small ship, wasn't he? So... I always assumed that was just a really small cube. I don't know why, <laughs> just because that's all we'd seen at that point. So I was like, it's a cube, but it's really tiny, and it only fits like five or six people in it. Mm. But uh, No, the probe ship would make absolute sense, I guess. You're right. Yeah. Awesome. yeah. So um, I quite like seeing some variety. So. Yeah, I think it's a hit as well. I think 
it fits the Borg aesthetic and the whole kind of geometric shape thing better than mm. either the ship in descent, which probably wasn't, it you know, might have been a stolen ship or something. Um, although Scorpion muddies that waters a bit, considering it's a Borg mine, whatever that means. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I or was, even. I, I always I assumed that um, as the Borg developed individuality in, in, uh, before descent, they, um, the ship just went absolutely bananas. <laughs> so, uh, and it was kind of yeah. sort of just an outgrowth of some chaotic thinking. I just assumed it was an board. alien ship that Laura and the Borg had just boarded and killed the crew and taken it over. Because it doesn't look anything like a Borg thing. Um, but yeah, it's weird, as I say, when they, in Scorpion they bring up a Borg mine and it's that exact shape. And I was mm. like, what? <laughs> but yeah, I think the probe's more successful than that and more so even than the Queen ship, which just goes over the top. <laughs> you know, It could have just been a simple diamond and it would have been fine, but then they add spinning bits and extra frame and everything and it's like okay you've you've overdone this now you know <laughs> i know it's the queen but we've over decorated the borgness of this one a little bit <laughs> yeah so i, I like the pro chip it, 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 it fits it seems to fit the aesthetic so perfectly and like you said it gives something that it's feasible that a starship could destroy a little bit easier even though they yeah. did so quite cleverly anyway it wasn't just a matter of well it's only a small ship we'll just overpower it you know the idea of just beaming a torpedo to the central place and i was like oh, clever so mm. clever <laughs> yeah and as you say, for any species, it makes sense they would have scout ships as well as you know smaller pro yeah. ships and scout ships as well as great big ones. So, uh, yeah. Well, I'm going to do one more then for today. Um, this might end up controversial, but we'll see. Uh, and that is hit or miss the Klingons as portrayed in Discovery. <laughs> All right. So as, um, the last time I was on on here, I was I, I remember saying to you that I, I felt. I'm generally so positive about Star Trek that I was probably going to say hit for all of them, but you did get me in a miss um, <laughs> that time. Um, but no, I'm I'm happy with the Klingons in Discovery. I've no, I never had, at any point had any problem with them. Okay. Um, so yeah, they're absolutely a hit with me. I appreciated sort of they just pushed the envelope a bit with the makeup. I didn't think they were that different. Um, I think probably if anything, people may be a bit jarred by the the, the lack of hair. But they actually addressed that for series two, and so yeah. said, "Oh yeah, this is this this is a uh, a thing where some some Klingons like to say like to shave all the hair off when they go to war." Yeah, um, even though we've never seen that in any war since. <laughs> I know, but then to be fair, um, this it's, it's just like anything. The, certain things come in and out of fashion and in and out of trends, don't they? Yeah, yeah, so, I guess. A hundred years on, when uh, we have the Klingons go to war against the Dominion, they mm. might just be like. Ah, that's a stupid thing people used to do. Why'd they do that? <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. Um, yeah, and it, yeah, I, I, I just don't think we need every little detail explained like that. You know, it's it's fine to put these things. So I, I enjoyed them, yeah. I liked them. And it was nice to see a sort of different element in a different sort of mm. thing around them. <laughs> that's fair enough. I'm very, very torn on this one. Um, I love the acting portrayal of the the Klingons. Um, I don't understand. A lot of the people that hear on it are like, they, they aren't recognisably Klingon. They don't act like it, to which I say, that's BS. That's just yeah. sheer, that's confirmation bias on your part because you don't like the look and the kind of cannon breaking because they act exactly like Klingons. I'm sorry, they just do. <laughs> it fits perfectly for me, um, you know, because everyone's like, oh, well, they could be any species. What are they? No, they're, they're definitely Klingons. <laughs> you know, but uh, I kind of agree that the makeup was too far because you had weird, like head shapes and stuff um you can kind of see in the difference between the laurel makeup between season one and two in season one she has this massive bulbous head <laughs> and then in season two they just desperately try and scale it back down again um but it becomes quite apparent um so i think the makeup was a bit too severe in places but then again they nail it in some other instances so i think for example call uh, the makeup they use for that character yeah. is it's pitch perfect. Um, they just didn't need to go as far as they did with some of the other things. Um, and because I'm a nerd, I am kind of annoyed by the fact that Enterprise went to the trouble of explaining the whole original series discrepancy only for Discovery to then ignore that explanation again. So it's kind of like, oh, <laughs> what was the point? Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I don't think that um, the, 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 the augment virus from Enterprise uh, is necessarily ignored as much as it's like not necessarily every single Klingon suffers from it. They may have found a way to halt yeah. the spread. Um, yeah, I so, guess. But um... And a, a race like the Klingons are going to have different factions and leaders overthrown. We see, yeah, we see s several shifts in leadership through the course of next gen into DS9. Yeah. So if we have 
if, if you've got, air, you know, you've got the, the discovery type of Klingons, you know, you've got the, the ones with the augment virus, you know, they're going to be a, they're going to have different levels of power at different times. So yeah. I've got no problem sort of assuming that following Laurel, she was overthrown and the augment guy, uh, were the ones who sort of mm. made a power grab for a bit. You know, I think and, it would have just been nice if we'd maybe seen a couple of them in background scenes that didn't have the ridges mm. as a kind of, but I guess that would have confused the average viewer who would have wondered what was going on. And uh, I'm less bothered with it than some people because, as, as you rightly point out, they've done that with the Klingons already. I mean, nobody during the motion picture was like, what's that? It doesn't look like a Klingon. It's just mm. eh, different times. They look different. We'll shrug our shoulders and pretend we'd seen it all along. Um, so I'm not that bothered by that. I'm more, <laughs> again, this is really nerdy, but I'm more bothered by the fact that the ship designs are so ridiculous and outrageous. Um, mm. But that's because I have massive issue with Brian Fuller's overall ship designs on that first season anyway, because he went out of his way to d deliberately say he wanted everything not to look like recognizably Starfleet and Klingon ships, to which I just say, then what was the point? <laughs> <laughs> what, why? It's just being awkward, being obtuse for the sake of it, because it's like, no, I want every nacelle to be square. I want all the ships to look super advanced. I want Klingon ships that you don't recognize as Klingon ships. And it's like, then why do a show? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> You're doing a Star Trek show. It's got a visual language. Stick to it, you know? Yeah. But, uh, yeah. I mean, they did address that later on and introduced the D7 yes. crews. I was just going to say, so. I think, having said that, I love that they introduced the D7 and seem to, therefore, with a lot of season two, say, yes, we're different, but don't worry, we'll pivot into that original series and we'll make it match up on some small yeah. level, you know? So, And as I said, the acting, I think, just saves it for me because between uh, Shazad Latif, uh, Mary Chifo, uh, obviously primarily playing Klingons, um, Kenneth Mitchell, uh, a couple yes. of times over as well um, and the way the Klingon stories are portrayed I think it saves it from the kind of initial mistakes that were made in execution so I would say hit just but with uh, with reservations um, yeah so yeah. Yeah. well that will conclude the hit on this section then uh, then that moves us on to uh, the main bulk of the episode then which will be the review uh, and I will begin analysis Spark Analysis. Yeah, so as I mentioned, this is our first kind of official original series review. Uh, it was an episode that was designed to fit into the theme of the Borg and AI that we're doing throughout this second season, but we are giving the Borg a bit of a rest outside of the hit or miss section. Uh, and I asked Rick for an AI based episode, and he selected this one, The Changeling, uh, from the original series, uh, the one that deals with the Nomad probe. Um, so before I get into my little fast facts and things, uh, what were your initial kind of spoiler free thoughts and impressions, and when did you first? Uh, find yourself drawn to this episode, Rick. <laughs> uh, the Changeling's just been one of my favourite episodes. Um, I think it's, I just really, really enjoy it. Um, you can draw similarities, I think, between Nomad and St. Vigia. Um, oh, completely, yeah. <laughs> but all in all, I think I prefer The Changeling as an episode, as a story, I think. Right? Oh, right, okay. Yeah, um, I think Nomad's brilliant. I think, um, the, the, yeah, just the whole the whole storyline of it, uh, the danger of this thing that's gone so, that we created, but has accidentally become so intelligent, it, it now thinks it's beyond us and sees us as insects, is great. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, it's a, it's a very science fiction -y idea, merging with an alien probe kind of thing and stuff as well, isn't it? So, uh, awesome. Um, well, I'll just go into, as I say, this series I've been starting with just a few fast facts about the episode. They're probably things you already know if you're a big fan of the episode, but just to give a bit of extra interest for anybody who doesn't know this. Uh, and the first uh, fact that I have is um, the idea that Uhura would speak Swahili as her first language when she was mind wiped actually came from Nichelle Nichols herself, even though Nichelle doesn't speak Swahili. Um, it led to a feud with the director of the episode, which eventually made its way to Gene Roddenberry, who agreed with Nichols, and uh, that led to a special linguist being hired to write the few le uh, scenes with lines of Swahili dialogue in the episode. Um, yeah. <laughs> I kind of love that story that Nichelle was put her foot down and was like, look, Nichelle Nichols doesn't speak Swahili, but Uhura does. So, <laughs> so, I, yeah. I, didn't, I, I, did, I knew Nichelle had um, suggested Swahili. I hadn't realised she didn't speak it. No, um, not at all. <laughs> I, I, to be fair, on a, on a show that was as budget crunched as, as Star Trek was, the fact that um, Roddenberry then went to bat for it and got a, um, a yep. linguist hired to do that, because it's really well done. I was the, yeah, it struck me actually rewatching it for this the bit where she just falls into Swahili. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, if you if you told me right after that that Nichelle Nichols did not speak, I'd not have believed you. And yeah, to be fair, not, so, that, yeah. not that I would recognise any Swahili, obviously. Yeah. 
Well, so, again, I don't either, but it certainly sounds convincing, so I have to assume it's, it's accurate. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, the second fact, then, this episode, as I kind of alluded to earlier, is one of four times that Kirk talks a computer to death, along with the return of the Archons, iMode, and the Ultimate Computer. Uh, the techniques also used against a robot in What Are Little Girls Made Of? Uh, the episode's also one of only a handful in the original series that take place entirely aboard the Enterprise. The others include Charlie X, Journey to Babel, Ilan of Troyes, and Is There In Truth No Beauty? interesting that it's uh you wouldn't think of it as a bottle show but it kind of is when you think of it like that just the enterprise yeah. sets and uh, no planets or anything nothing that they visit or so, so yeah no uh, I, I mean you know they, i suppose just having to build one prop they don't, they don't even have to hire a full guest actor they're probably yeah. it's just a voice actor yeah, yeah. So. voice actor good so, voice actor though uh, so what oh, are yes. your thoughts on this uh, on this constantly repeating plot of kirk talking computers to death because they did go to that well a lot <laughs> It's actually one of my absolute favourites, and this is something we make a lot of reference to on um, Ten Blackwood. It's just right. the joy of uh, the fact that Kirk can talk a computer till smoke's coming out of its ears and it blows up. <laughs> uh, it's great, isn't it? it, it, it I mean, it is, it, it's a bit of a trope, but it's a really fun one. Um, yeah. it's, um, it's such a trope yeah. that I love the fact that Futurama even takes the mick out of it in their Star Trek episode. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, it's probably an yeah. evil computer's enslaved the population. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and taking that baton lower decks when they went back to uh, the Landu planet. And it's like, yes, damn it, we've gonna... told you. <laughs> <laughs> love it. You've got to love it. Um, yeah. Awesome. Uh, my last fast fact you've basically already hinted on, but um, although not credited as such, this episode is likely part of the inspiration for the motion picture, uh, which has a remarkably similar plot and antagonist, which led some fans at the time of the film's release to adopt the jokey subtitle, Where Nomad Has Gone Before. <laughs> <laughs> right then. Yeah. Um, I'll jump us into the episode. You know, uh, as we do it, I'll just basically go by piece by piece, roughly chronologically. If I miss anything or there's anything you want to comment on or, or jump in and, and uh, get us talking about, then by all means. Um, but yeah. So I'll start us with the, the pre credit scene is relatively quick, um, but we find out the Enterprise is in the system of the Malurians. Um, initially, I thought I heard Lurians and was thinking it was Morn species, but no, don't worry. <laughs> uh, there's no sign of life, but there was supposed to be 4 billion people there. And yet there's no signs of any of the usual reasons, environmental catastrophes, etc. Uh, but then this mysterious image appears and fires on the Enterprise. We get the classic bridge shaky effect and enter the credits. So uh, any quick thoughts on this opening sequence then in terms of it's certainly intriguing. <laughs> Um, I mean, I, just, I am wondering, is that the highest death count in the shortest space of time ever in Star Trek? Four billion people have been killed in the opening. Probably is, and I know, yeah, I know that's controversial with a few people, and it very much is like four billion people, and yet we're joking about this thing by the end of the episode, you know? It's, yeah, it's, um, I mean, had, yeah, that, I, yeah, it's, it's pretty grim, isn't it? It's like, yeah, oh, the entire God. Malorian system, I think they say, so... Yeah, this is... billion lives. <laughs> do, do, I mean, yeah, does Star Trek ever even match this? Um, maybe the planet killer in the Doomsday Machine, I suppose. Oh, yeah, because that takes out whole systems and things as well, maybe. Yeah. I mean, even the but, combined yeah. Dominion War probably isn't four billion when you think about it, yeah. Uh, well, it just makes it kind of immediately, the, the threat level here is like, this This thing is huge. This thing is so destructive. Well, I have I have my uh, I have my controversial statements with regard to that as well because the threat level is remarkably inconsistent, unfortunately, um, uh, which I'll get to because in the the next scene I'll just move us there. They say the Enterprise's powers restored, the shields are holding, um, but they can take three more attacks. It's just to you know, even though they were hit with what was it? Um, Spock mentions that that first attack was the equivalent of ninety photon torpedoes, but this only weakens the shields by twenty percent. Which is really confusing. Um, and then uh, when Nomad absorbs the energy of one photon torpedo, Kirk remarks, how could anything possibly absorb that much energy? Your shield just absorbed 90 of them, dude. Just <laughs> what do you want about? <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit of a jarring, inconsistent bit. So. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those things where I think the writer hadn't really thought it through. It just was like, I want it to sound like it's got a lot of power. What This might work, but yeah. <laughs> they decide the Enterprise can't take another hit after they're being shot at. So they decide to communicate, um, at which point I've also said, related back to what we were saying, everybody's very calm, considering that they're like inches away from utter destruction. And uh, yeah. Uh, highly trained Starfleet crew. You know, well, I guess, yeah. Uh, in but... the face of destruction. 
Exactly. I do like the uh, the very Star Trek and kind of way that they look at things when Spock says, you know, this thing's only basically whatever really small size. Um, and everyone's shocked by this, and Spock just says, well, intelligence does not necessarily require bulk. Uh, it's like, yeah, that's a very trekky type message, I think, isn't it, really? Um, yeah. But this uh, this opening never really stops for breath. It's very action-packed, I think, from the start, even if they are a bit calm. So by now yeah. we get the garbled message, and uh, we hear it's an old-style code, which is a good little development of the mystery. Um, the communication kind of bounces back, which reminded me of that one episode of Voyager. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. When they, they communicate and then they have a distress call, but it turns out it's from them from before oh, they actually. entered the anomaly or something. Yeah. Mm. Um, I don't think it's deliberate, obviously, but it was just one of those weird things. That I was like, oh, yeah, I remember when that happened. Um, but, yeah, they get overloaded and then eventually Nomad is able to uh, scan data banks or whatever and speak in English with the voice of uh, Vic Perrin, legendary actor slash voice actor. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> it's kind of cool that we have the kind of initial... What's the word I'm looking for? This uh, disparity between understanding of like, we can't board you. You're too small. You have to come yeah. here. <laughs> it doesn't quite grasp what, what humans are at that level, you know? Um, yeah. yeah, as far as he's concerned, an infestation is an infestation. So Exactly. But uh, likewise, the Enterprise crew are initially convinced there's just like tiny people in there. So even when it beams aboard, they're just like, I don't think there's anybody in there. I was like, imagine yeah. if there was. <laughs> What would that have been? Just four yeah. billion lives, and then this tiny ant-sized person comes out like, "I will kill you all." <laughs> I, I quite like that. Um, I like that their that their thing is like when Spock, as you say, Spock says, um, "Intelligence does not necessarily require bulk." So that's it. They've, mm. they've decided it's a it's a ship full of tiny people. <laughs> uh, yeah, fair enough. I mean, Starfleet have probably seen weirder, but uh, yeah. Um, I'm wondering where you stand on this thing. This Kirk's decision to just talk it down by saying, oh, well, you can board us and that'll be fine. Um, I, I think that's, I, I like that Scotty questions that order, but to me, it just seems very reckless of Kirk uh, with his justification being, well, once it's on board, it won't be firing on us because that's some really dumb logic. It can still fire on you internally. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it, 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 if you're on board, it can destroy you from within and it's not going to affect it. It can withstand the power of one torpedo. So. Yeah, one whole torpedo. <laughs> Um, yeah, it, it, I don't know. It, it, it's a kind of a case of what, what, what's the alternative, I suppose. Yeah, I wish they'd kind of addressed it like that as a bit like it's an act of desperation as opposed to like, Kirk is so clever coming up with this plan. And it's like, oh, he's not. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, anyway, it's nice when we first get to see the probe and it's kind of hovering on the transporter pad. Um, yeah. I know it's a very low bar, but for the 60s, having this kind of floating, flying around type device without seeing visible strings or anything is actually pretty cool, I think. so. I yeah. always find it quite an effective effect. It looks really nice. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah I yeah. love the look of it. Um, so when they, and I forget the wording, but if they beamed in, then they're sort of at, at the point where they're realising it's not a ship full of tiny people. Yes, um, yeah. And Scotty says something like, it's definitely mechanical. Yes, yeah. It's like, well, yeah, yes, yes. I can see why you're the engineer, Scotty. It's definitely <laughs> mechanical. He does. But then I think it's either him or Sp um, Spock at least specifies it's actually clearly a very sophisticated computer, um, mm -hmm. as opposed to just, you know, <laughs> it's obviously mechanical again. Wow, Scotty, that's why they pay you the big bucks. <laughs> yeah. Um, I do like the line. Again, it's a reference, um, a kind of weird forward reference to First Contact, but the line when they first beam aboard, and I think it's Dr. McCoy says, well, should we just go up and knock? <laughs> when they still think there's tiny people in there, I guess. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Uh, it's kind of cool seeing it. You know, they, I think they're as shocked as the audience when it actually starts to move. Because, uh, again, yeah. 60s, you weren't really expecting that, and it's uh, moving around. And uh, Yeah. Um, I do like as well... Throughout here, I like that there's little drips and drabs about the mystery. It doesn't just immediately answer it, because then it starts talking about there was much taken from the other. Um, so even when they recognize the name from an old Earth probe, you know there's more to it than that and, and kind of wonder what it is. Um, so, yeah, I like it. I like that the uh, dramatic music here as well just builds up the tension, because the music in the original series is just brilliant, isn't it, really? Oh, yes. yeah. I think it's excellent, the way it uh, builds to the end of every scene uh, with the kind of dramatic um, cliffhanger -y type sting really cool <laughs> yeah but, uh, yeah <laughs> and the other note that i made is just like so when nomad decides to go wherever it's going 
Kirk's like, Spock Bones, you're with me. And I'm like, Kirk took Spock and Bones because of course he did. <laughs> it's like, there's no logic behind that decision. Take Scotty. As he said, he's the engineer. He's like, nah, me, Spock and Bones, we're the stars. <laughs> like, why the ship's doctor? What's he going to do? <laughs> they rather foolishly and short-sightedly decide they're going to show star charts of Earth, of the Sol system to this thing. Um Mm, not sure yeah. about the wisdom there, but yeah. uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's on a par with back in Space Seed when they show we give calm technical manuals. Yes, of the ship. yeah, catch yourself up with our century, why don't you? That won't hurt us, yeah, very <laughs> silly. Um, but yeah, this is where we get our first mention of you are the creator, the Kirk, and yeah. um, various things. Sterilization procedure was unnecessary and. One of my favorite lines with regard to Dr. McCoy, this is one of your units. It functions irrationally. <laughs> so, yeah, very good. Um, again, in terms of the developing mystery, when it starts seeing things like, um, I was programmed to look for a biological infestation and destroy what isn't perfect. I was like, wow, that's really deep. That's kind of Borg, Cyberman-esque kind of thing when you look at it. And yeah, deep. <laughs> that's the first time I think it had been addressed in the franchise like that. So awesome. Yeah. Um, I mean, I like I like that we set this thing, you know, there's the ordered logical computer thinking versus the irrational organic thinking. Uh, yeah. So you can see, you can kind of justify, we'll see where, where Noban has justified this imperfection mm. sterilization thing from. It's actually quite smartly done. Yeah, it is. But I also like that there's a level of having to keep the organics one step ahead of it because... When Kirk's going to admit, I'm not the creator, and Spock's the one that's, like, keeping the charade going, I guess. He's like, uh, oh, no, no, the creator tells you to do this because he's aware that that's our bargaining chip and we can potentially use this, so let's not blow our cover here, you know. Um, again, very Spock. I like that level of, uh, of thinking. And, uh, yeah, as, as they head out, though, they decided to assign a red shirt to Nomad. And I was like, oh, no, this isn't going to end well. <laughs> This is the stereotypical moment when you are foolish. But there you go. Um, but yeah, said red shirt, Lieutenant Singh, uh, checks in with Uhura, who starts singing the song Beyond Antares, which intrigues Nomad, who just simply slips off to the bridge. Because, <laughs> you know, heavily armed Starfleet flagship. Security! <laughs> <laughs> just this thing floating through the corridors right to the centre of the bridge. <laughs> but never mind. Um... Yeah. Uh, yeah, the next scene of, uh, of of the main characters is when they're discussing the Nomad probe itself. So we get the initial specifications on the screen, and um, there's a cameo by the director of the episode, Mark Daniels, who plays oh. Doctor Jackson Roykirk, uh, wearing one of James Doohan's Scotty dress uniforms. <laughs> uh, and this is where they establish that yeah, Captain James Kirk, Jackson Roykirk, name similarities. The probe is confused, but you can understand where it's coming from. Something's happened to its original function, so that it's now perfection, according to its relentless logic, is all that can survive, and it must, by nature, destroy us. At which point, I think the music did this for me, but I just wrote the note, dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> Very 60s, like, no, end of act, we are in trouble. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so we get to the, one of the key scenes now, which is Nomad on the bridge. Uh, as it kind of floats through and the entire sort of the bridge staff are so willfully ignorant of it that it's almost amusing this probe just floating around like uhura literally just carrying on singing as she's staring at it and i'm like nobody's getting up out of their seat or anything these guys are exceptionally well trained aren't they? <laughs> really? but, uh, yeah yeah, yeah, it's that, um, yeah that, that calm in the face of danger thing and they're just, just oh, yeah. Really, yeah but here's where we get a couple of the the more controversial things from the episode at least from my standpoint where it wants to know about music, so it asks her to think about music, fires some kind of beam at her and completely erases her mind, uh, or her memories at least. And then when Scotty sees what it's doing and intervenes, it literally just kills Scotty. And we get what I think might be the first usage by Dr. McCoy of, he's dead, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that, was, um, that's, that was a pretty shocking moment as well, because... Um... I mean, when I watched first watched this, I'd already seen the movie, so I knew full well Scotty wouldn't die from mm. this. But um, I bet at the time that must have been like fairly mind blowing because Scotty's almost a main character at that point. He's yeah. been recurring since the pretty much since the beginning. So suddenly yeah. they killed him off. He's yeah. I was like, what? 
Yeah, I, mean, I can't really say the same, because I'm the same, obviously I'd already seen a lot before I saw this episode, so the impact of like, oh my gosh, Scotty's dead was lost, because I know he wasn't. So. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it would have been interesting to note anybody at the time that was watching, did they actually think like, wow, they killed off Scotty? But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sad. So um, I'll, I'll ask you this now then, so what is what are your thoughts on this whole Nomad is able to repair Scotty and bring him back to life, first of all, um, and secondly, the idea that somebody whose memories are completely wiped can be re-educated in a few days. Uh, thoughts on those two things. So, okay, so, I mean... It, 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 I find, it, yeah, I mean, I, it, it's difficult to rationalise a headcanon as to why Nomad, whose entire thing is to sterilise certain life forms, also has the capability to repair them. Um, and it's handy, but, you know, it's... Also, at the same time, I don't want Scotty to stay dead. So no, no, of course. Um, it's quite it's 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 useful, um, and I suppose in a way, it's a kind of a tantalising promise of like, what other crazy te- things does Snowman know? Mm. You know, if we can, what 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 knowledge does he have that we could utilise? So yeah, it kind of makes 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 working with Nomad quite an enticing prospect in that sense. Yeah. Um, the, the thing that bothers me is that they even have, like, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to just be, oh, all we need to do is repatch, patch him up physically and he's fine once he's already dead. And they even have McCoy say, a man isn't just a biological unit that you can patch back together. Then the episode doesn't address that whatsoever. It just seems like the episode goes, yes, it is. He's fine. Shush. <laughs> yeah. That's so weird. Like, what? <laughs> why, why introduce that question in the first place if your answer to it is, shut up, McCoy? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, speaking of uh, sort of weird moments and stuff, though, um, a little bit of uh, classic William Shatner overacting when he finds out about uh, Scotty and Uhura on the bridge leads to Uhura getting taken to Zikbe uh, and referencing uh, Nomad references Uhura as a unit. Uh, and Kirk says, the unit is a woman, to which, again, in very 1960s fashion, Kirk's response, <laughs> the Nomad's response is um, a mass of conflicting emotions. Yikes. <laughs> yeah. And oh, there's also a little bit of a re- closer reaction of Spock after he says that. And Spock's, I don't know, it's almost like Spock's giving a sort of a, yeah. He's <laughs> women, of, eh? Yeah. I know, and it's a bit like, oh, it's one of those moments you're watching it and you think for all the great stuff now and again, it's just like, oh, the, the, the flipping 60s, man. Yeah. Oh, to be fair, with Spock, you can probably assume that he's he's referring to humans in general as a mass of conflicting emotions. And that makes it make a lot more sense than... Kind of yeah. just having the right to have the probes here. Women, eh? What a bizarre stash of emotions they are. Yeah. <laughs> oh, not good. But, uh... No, it's. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, uh, my, my, I, I just, I've just adopted the headcanon that actually Uhura wasn't didn't have her memories wiped. Hmm. Um, she had them damaged or something, and the re-education ends up bringing them out because, yeah. Mm, can't, even can't then, though, I mean, it. I've. I've I've known people that have had like brain diseases and stuff that have lost memories and it's taken years to get them to any semblance of like the memories they used to have and, and back to normal. And it just seems very brushed off that it's like, um, we've got a whore at a college level after a day of teaching her how to read and write. And I'm like, yeah. Ooh, eh? <laughs> just, why? It just seems like well, you're if, if, hand if you can do that with If you can do that with someone whose memory has been entirely wiped, I mean, surely the, the school system by that point, yeah. why, why, why do people need to go to the Starfleet Academy for three years? Well, exactly. Why are they at the Academy for four years if they can learn all this in a week? <laughs> Doesn't make sense. Just, uh, yeah. As you say, some people have tried to head cannon it away, and there's been some people that have said the memories aren't completely erased. They're just, as you say, like locked away, or uh, she's prevented access to them like a computer, and all it does is give her back access when a couple of things are knitted back in there that then brings everything back quickly. Mm. So there's ways to get around it but i just think it was a silly kind of plot idea Uh, and like i said it's very 1960s sci-fi as fantasy for me at times Um, yeah yeah it's one of those things i I can't head canon it but i wouldn't ever i wouldn't ever expect any future series to strictly adhere to that as a canon item no of course no definitely not um but talking of kind of silliness when you were on about like um giving car and specifications and stuff uh they demand that nomad repairs scotty fair enough 
uh, but then give him all the tapes, <laughs> like physiology and biology and stuff. I'm like, it's so foolish. If it's looking to destroy you, you've just given it every way. Like, here's all our weaknesses. You know? But uh, I guess you kind of need to have it patch him up. And by this point, they were aware that it would obey the, what do you call him, the creator, Kirk or whatever. So I think, uh, yeah, they were kind of reliant on that fact, weren't they? Yeah. At that point, um, so. Yeah, true enough. But uh, yeah, anyway, just to quickly move us on, then we get, as I see, we've mentioned McCoy being unhappy at the machine, which is very in character with him. And even when it saves Scotty, he's a little bit reluctant to accept that, which I think is fair. Um, but then Scott, Sp ah, Spock is uh, kind of wanting to keep this thing calm and says that Nomad itself is almost a life form. But Kirk uh, has had enough and just says, no, no, well, you have to disable this. It's a killer. Um, to which I would say, okay, about time you finally got there. Probably would have been there, you know, two seconds after we'd have killed four billion people myself. But okay, you're a bit slow, Kirk. You got there. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I suppose um, the, 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 this is one of those points, I think, where it's difficult to draw the line between Kirk as the as having that to enact that military arm of his duty where he defends the Federation and mm. the Explorer. You know, where we're we out there to meet and befriend yeah. new life. And this, you know, I think it's very, it's very easy to watch this and say, definitely Nomad Falls is a military threat. He's wiped out four billion people on the planet. And he's, and he's quite happy to go to Earth and do the same. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's, it, I think possibly that could have been more clearly defined in the, in the story, in the dialogue. Yeah. Spock sort of, this is practically a new life form. It's kind of touching on it. But, mm -hmm. yeah, it's almost like, actually, do you know, this this would be a really good point to have that, that debate, to really um, break that thing down of, like, this is a new life, you know, this is a military threat, and which, which, side, which side are people falling on as, as the episode progresses? Uh, it also misses the chance, I think, which Star Trek does a lot to address this whole idea of we've lost four billion lives, but we didn't know any of them, so it's fine kind of thing. Like, imagine if it had taken out the entire Earth system, you wouldn't be laughing about it like, ha my son, the doctor, by the end of the episode, you'd be like, that thing murdered billions. You know what I mean? Yeah. I do like, though, that because um, this is where we get Kirk and Spock trying to communicate with the probe. And uh, Spock says it has an almost human stubbornness because it won't lower its shields till Kirk tells it to. Um, but then when it scans Spock, it says this unit is different. Well ordered. And I was like, oh, of course it gets on with Spock, doesn't it? <laughs> Loving the logic. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Well, I think that's, uh, that's also a... quite a good thing that Spock is that kind of bridge almost. Yeah, he's able to be literally at some point. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's able um... to sort of explain the motivations a little bit better. He can, he can, he can get the logical mindset, but he can also translate that to to those of us who are more of a mass of conflicting emotions. Definitely, uh... yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, because that is basically what happens is that um, he decides, you know, what you've got to go with is a mind meld, which is kind of daft and nonsensical and I don't love it because it's just can you mind meld with a machine but then the more I thought about it the more I was like I'm fine with it during the motion picture so why could I it would be very hypocritical of me to say I'm not fine with it here if in both cases they are virtually life forms because they are machines that have evolved thus far so I was like even though it looks ridiculous because it's Leonard Nimoy touching this blatantly machine prop you kind of have to go with it on a sci-fi level, um, so I can, I guess, let my, let them away with that on that on that level. So, yeah. Well, this is this is the thing. I mean, oftentimes, you know, we, we we love Star Trek. We take our Star Trek very seriously, but sometimes it's it's easy, it's easy to take it so seriously. We kind of forget it is science fiction, and you kind of mm. have to make some allowances, you know. Uh, anyway, I did say though that um, I felt really sorry for Leonard Nimoy having to kind of act with this, just touching this very flimsy looking uh, prop and act like he was talking to a. My word, that man's a good actor because he sells it just to to perfection, even though he looks ridiculous. And to any lesser actor, they would come out of that being fully embarrassed. But he's like, nope, I'm going to commit. And he's going around going, um, we are Tanru, we are the other. We need to sterilize the imperfection. Sterilize, <laughs> sterilize, sterilize. And then Kirk's just but, trying to slap him out of it like, no, Spock, break the connection. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's one of the things that works. It's Lennon and I just goes for it. You know, I mean, let's not forget a, a, a year previous to this, he basically mind melded with a with a carpet. Uh, <laughs> and, and Devil in the Dark is considered one of the best episodes of all time. So, 
No kill I indeed. Yeah, come <laughs> yes. back. Yeah, yeah. So, man, Nimoy was great though. He really was. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Because you know, he he he, he approached. Yeah, you know, a lot of actors could have just thought this is silly. I'm just going to be be daft, have fun with it. But he took it, he took it seriously, and he he, he really had that whole. You know, he defended and protected the the Spock thing so much. I think so. Mm. You know, he, he just put a lot into it, and it shows. And it's why it works. Definitely. I think. Mm. Definitely agreed. Um, I do think that this scene slightly over explains things to the audience because um, they repeat multiple times that like, oh, it was supposed to sterilize soil samples, this alien thing, and it melded with our probe and now it wants to sterilize all life. And I was like, yeah, we know. We've established this. <laughs> we just move us along here at this point. Um, but, you know, again, it was the 60s. I guess they probably would have thought the audience are new to the whole sci-fi idea. So... It makes sense. I suppose. I suppose when you only just got your series made, the first part was rejected for being too cerebral. Mm. You kind of feel that you maybe you just need to pitch to the lowest common denominator. I don't know. Yeah. Sorry. Well, yeah, because it was a very network main stream, I guess, television show. So, yeah, yeah. fair enough. Um, I always forget that the episode gets its name from an actual legend. So, uh, yeah, Kirk mentions uh, this thing is like the Changeling DiCaprio meme recognize that um, and then says it's the legend of a being that would imitate and replace a human child i'm not sure that fits i think that was just because they wanted a cool title for the episode because that's not what this probe was trying to do at all <laughs> but never no, mind no. <laughs> it, they, they do get around it as best they can by saying oh the thing's gone space happy it thinks kirk's its mother which is the only thing saving us so i was like all right so you're trying to claim it's pretending to be Kirk's non-existent biological child. Right, whatever. <laughs> um, the next scene for me was very shocking because Nomad just seems to kill two red shirts out of nowhere. <laughs> just in the uh, corridors, just zaps them and heads to engineering. And this little thing floating around again, it looks silly, but it's not terrible. Um, decides to repair the engines and does the thing that again happened entirely too often in the original series where they go to whoop 10, whoop 11. No, oh, no, the ship can't stand it. Oh, and Kirk orders it to stop. And then, it, you know, uh, this is the biological unit that created you, but I'm giving you new programming. And it decides there's much to consider and it must reevaluate uh, at which point I was like, okay, it's getting kind of menacing and we're doing some weird camera angles and stuff as we're trying to establish that this is a threat and this is kind of a key point uh, to things, you know. Um, and this is when it decides, you know, uh, it's unwise to admit that you're biological because now it's decided Earth itself must be destroyed and it will sterilize Earth. End of act cliffhanger, which, uh, again, big stakes. <laughs> yes. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, the next scene, again, just uh, reminded me of how kind of weirdly Kirk takes a long time to realize things because his captain's log is just a nomad's present has become nightmarish, to which I'd written, become nightmarish? Before you met it, it killed four billion people. <laughs> how bad are your nightmares? <laughs> anyway, uh, the thing kills two more red shirts because, of course, it does at Star Trek. <laughs> and they track it through the shafts and the corridors, but it's uh, relentless and it will not stop and the tense music and everything, and uh, it's established Kirk's info from sickbay, so it knows, you know, that he is a biological function and whatever else, but uh, its systems are failing, and so Kirk calls for anti-gravs and for them to go to engineering. So by this point, it's established that Kirk isn't its creator, so it won't take his orders anymore. It will kill the life forms, but not the vessel, um, because it's only programmed for biological uh, sterilization, which is a nice touch, I think, even though it doesn't really, it doesn't affect anything. But I was like, okay, there is still some logic to this thing. It's not just like, I am angry, destroy. It's like, no, you're a, you're a disease and we need to clean this ship and then it'll be fine. You know, um, I can kind of yeah. see the, the sense to that. I suppose so. But I suppose technically the most efficient way to uh, kill off the infestation would just blow the ship up in one go. So... Yeah, but that's like saying the most efficient way to deal with the cockroach infestation is to burn down your house. You still need a house. <laughs> but it was, it, it was happy to try and destroy the Enterprise in the initial bit of the episode. Yes, that's true. That's what, Again, that initial scene doesn't make sense at all in retrospect, really. But, yeah, very weird. Um, but, yeah, and this is basically the scene where, again, Kirk just talks it to death. So it goes through um, biological units can't be imperfect. It was a biological unit that created you. 
you know, it was an imperfect being. Very first contact you reference there. Uh, you're imperfect. You must be sterilized. All things in error must uh, be sterilized. But then Kirk tells it, no, well, you're in error because I'm not Roy Kirk. So you made that error. Then you didn't uh, immediately sterilize me. So that was another error. You failed your prime function. Uh, and it decides that the logic is impeccable. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's starting at this point to do the whole like error confused can't <laughs> deal with this and they run in with the anti-grabs and throw it to the transporter and just beam it into space thankfully in the nick of time uh, where it blows up harmlessly uh, so yeah uh, that takes us into the last scene of the episode where Spock um, congratulates the dazzling display of logic they mention again that Uhura is now at college level somehow um, say that um, the destruction of Nomad was a waste but at least it saved billions of lives but then like I said the very tonally jarring sort of, well, imagine how I feel. My son, the doctor. Ha, ha, ha. Four billion lives. Uh, <laughs> also, if you actually have a son, he's going to be a doctor. So. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. But uh, that's the original series. For whatever reason, it really did feel like it had to end on a really cheap gag every episode, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't, it, like you say, it is, it is a bit jarring. Four billion people are dead because of that. I know what. You know, is yeah. that is that the entire race gone, or are there colonies? Are there others? Yeah, well, yeah, just genocide. But never mind, we didn't know. Them. But yeah, I think that's that's one of those things that's hit or miss with the original series because sometimes, if it's a tonally jokey-ish episode, those really cheap, pathetic gags work. Like Trouble with Tribbles, that end gag is terrible, but it fits that episode really well anyway. Yeah, so, yeah that's, perfect <laughs> time, that's but... where it works. But uh, yeah, I don't think here yeah, that that was quite appropriate. But, uh, no. Anyway. Um, no. So before I move to the next sort of few sections and things, then did you have any last thoughts or anything that I, I might have missed? Uh, no, I think, I think we covered all the bits there. Um, I mean, I do enjoy it, and I do love Kirk's... Uh, I, I just love any time Kirk talks computer to death. I find that <laughs> a, a, Fair a enough. brilliant trope. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a continually tense episode, uh, mm. except for the end bit. I do, I do enjoy that, because I, I find it very much very well done in that I get quite swept into the tension and the menace of it. Um, yeah, well, you're not alone. It's got definitely got its fans, as, I, as I'll get to mm. in the audience interaction section. But uh, yeah, yeah, I think I just ended up with a different view to perhaps the majority, which isn't to say that, you know, we'll find out later, but I didn't think it was the worst thing ever. But yeah, <laughs> I have my issues, shall we say. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the next thing then, just, just to finish off that kind of side of things, uh, this series I'm doing things a little bit differently. So I just wanted to ask what was your favourite character in the episode your favorite moment or scene and your favorite line of dialogue um okay so i think my favorite character is nomad because i just enjoy this this thing turns up and it's just trying <laughs> to puzzle out humans um and they're kind of always playing this you know once they realize oh he thinks you're the creator right that we're gonna have to play along and we could have descended into a ridiculous comedy farce there mm. um where it's like, oh no, don't let him find out that you're not really Jackson Roy Kirk. Um, <laughs> and they're all like, running around trying to change nameplates and stuff like that. <laughs> they should have done that. <laughs> um, but they do keep this tension and this menace. And you know, for, for a for, you know, quite a cheaply built thing, it's really well done. And Nomad is genuinely quite menacing. The whole time, so I just I've got to give him that. Great. I'm gonna I'm gonna chime in with my here. Normally I would let you finish, but I just have to say that um, I have written down in exact wording to prove that I'm not copying. Nomad itself is the most intriguing character, though this isn't really treated with the respect and depth that would be given to Vija later. Um, although Doctor McCoy comes a close second. <laughs> so yeah, that's my thoughts on favorite character. <laughs> yes. uh, awesome. Did you have any thoughts, or do you want to move to your favorite uh, moment or scene? Uh, okay, so favourite moment. Um, let's see. I think probably just the absolute chaos on the bridge when um, it wipes her his memory and then kills Scotty. Right. Okay. It's just, Fair just, it's, it's all of a sudden it's like, what, what the heck is going on? Yeah. Um, it's yeah. It's like I say, it's just saunters onto the bridge and everyone is like, oh, it's a floating robot. <laughs> like, like that happens <laughs> every cool. day. Fair um, enough. Um, I, I felt sure you were going to agree with me there because mine was um, my favourite moment was just Kirk's triumphant outsmarting and talking to death to neutralise the threat because it's mm. just cool. <laughs> just, you know, even though it's a common trope, it's still really cool when it happens. I think so. Yeah, and uh, yeah, your favourite line of dialogue if you have one. <laughs> uh, 
Um, a favourite line. Okay, so... Um, I mean, I quite like a lot of Nomad's dialogue. I think it's really mm. well done. But, um... Yeah. I just think, actually, I'm probably going to go with um, Kirk's... Um, Kirk's logic feedback loop. Mm. Uh, when he goes, you're, you are wrong. Jackson Roy Kirk, your creator, is dead. You've mistaken me for him. You're an error. You did not discover your mistake. You've made two errors. You were flawed and imperfect. You have not corrected my sterilization. You have made three errors. And yeah, you're just like... Exactly. Oh, it's, it's a bit. It's a bit like your boss telling you off. Uh, yeah. <laughs> several mistakes. Wow, I don't want to meet your boss. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair enough. Um, mine is a lot, lot more straightforward because I'm always, I think, drawn to just jokey daft lines. And I've already mentioned it, but my favourite line is, "This is one of your units. It functions irrationally." Nomad regarding Dr. McCoy. <laughs> yeah. Perfect, yeah. isn't it? Really. Yeah. Which I think yeah. McCoy would take as a point of pride. <laughs> oh, almost certainly, yeah. <laughs> the next section, as you're probably aware from last time, is the section that I call Gene's Vision. Um, and that is just basically where I ask, what kind of themes and major things from this episode do you think fit into this mythical ideology of Star Trek that some people claim is missing these days? <laughs> and what would fit the Gene's Vision idea from this uh, particular episode? Uh, so this is something I was... Um thinking is gene had this quite nice uh, thought that as we develop technology technology is something we would use and it wouldn't overrun us so mm -hmm. technology technology is brilliant advanced technology is fantastic you know it makes lives easier but you, you can't you can't make up for the human element and i think mm. nomad is one of those examples something so advanced but kirk can talk it into destroying itself yeah so and i think that's why it's a trope you know, it's yeah. when it's it's when when you when te machines dominate people, uh, kind of thing. So yeah, uh, that's so kind of feeding into what I said because I said I think one of the things that I noticed in this story and throughout Trek and especially the original series is that Roddenberry saying that emotion will always beat logic, but mm. it's best when the two work together towards a common goal, um, which I guess is the whole point of like Spock and McCoy as alternate angels on Kirk's shoulder as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Oh, yeah, sorry. Sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. Is there anything no, else? No, no. I mean, that's that's very much in keeping with the thing. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind of, I think, what my main thought, the, the way the episode would tie in with Rotten Reservation is very much, you know, technology is brilliant, but humanity will always be its, at its best um, yeah. overcoming it, sort of thing. Fair enough. Um, I also know that I think on a macro level, um, it's a common theme of Star Trek and particularly of Gene's writing that um, the, the kind of the search for the meaning of life and even for a creator, um, and you need to look no further than the motion picture, which is the same thing. It's a yeah. machine that wants to meet its creator and that wants to know the meaning of why it's here. Um, and it's asking all the questions that I think humans ask all through our lives and never get an answer to, um, which is very deep and again, very kind of, it's very Gene, I guess, very Star Trek. Um, and on a very smaller, much more micro level, um, it was nice to see the care that was taken of Uhura, especially by Nurse Chapel. Um, there was no impatience whatsoever. She was clearly, you know, dealing with her friend and she was so proud of her when she was reading, reading that the ball was blue or whatever basic thing. So I was like, oh, that's just a sweet little scene, really, isn't it? So, yeah. 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 Awesome. Even, yeah even though, as we sort of commented, it plays into the thing that doesn't really make sense. Yeah, but... that, that, it doesn't make sense in, in, on the wider sense of like, now she's educated, but... If, if it had been like this is going to be the woman who'll take care of her for months on end, then fair enough, you know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Anyway, um, so next up, I would probably go with the conclusions and scores. Um, I feel like I should probably start with mine because then we'll end on a high. I know it probably with yours. <laughs> if that's okay with me. So I'll go ahead. Uh, my conclusion was not one of the best episodes of the original series, but conversely, not one of the worst. Uh, the central idea is a fascinating piece of speculative and imaginative sci-fi, hence why the franchise returns to it. There's great character moments for the regulars, especially the main trio, but there are also things which come off as just silly, overly fantastical, or just nonsensical. Uh, the script feels the need to explain everything more than once and in detail, talking down to the audience, though this may be a consequence of the time it was written. The pacing is odd as the episode seems slow and occasionally plodding, but yet leaves a lot of potential not addressed or developed. Again, though, my familiarity with the story might be affecting my view on this. Uh, the ending, though, is satisfying and the defeat of the threat seems logical and believable. Entertaining and diverting episode without being hugely noteworthy, has issues but never entirely or egregiously bad. 
uh, exact middle of the road Star Trek, in my opinion. Uh, so I give it 2.5 or 2.5 Starfleet Deltas out of 5. Uh, yeah. so then, what about your uh, conclusion and your score, then, if you don't mind? Uh, I mean, I... I... I've kind of already said I really, really love this episode. It's just one of my favourites. Uh, I mean, I don't disagree necessarily a lot of your points, but mm. um, I kind of find the, the the concept is really fun. The menace yeah. and the threat is is fantastic. I think the music and the look and the effect with Nomad is really nicely done. Um, I think the theme is very much brilliant classic Star Trek in terms of like he, the um, machine trying to dominate humanity and humanity overcoming yeah. that um, and it's very much you know plays into those themes of um, the best approach is not just logic or just emotion but a blending um, um, yeah so and I, I would probably go with a four out of five on that four deltas for me I just, okay. I just really enjoy it that's fair enough. That's no problem. I mean, we are allowed to have other descending views. Not that oh, yeah. it's hugely different, but uh, yeah, it's amazing. Two people can watch something and have different views and still get along. Look at that. Yeah, <laughs> amazing. <well fit>. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell the internet whatever we do. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's fair enough. I think, uh, yeah, I can definitely see why it would be beloved, yeah. Yeah, at the end of the day, it's all sort of a bit subjective with your opinions, isn't it? What what works for one person doesn't work for another, but you know, we're all enjoying Star Trek overall. So yeah, I, I certainly wouldn't certainly wouldn't take it away from anybody who likes the episode, and I, I don't disagree with the reasons why you like it. Just as I don't think you disagree with any of the reasons I had an issue. It's just I have more of an issue with things than you do in some places, and that's allowed. You know? so, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, just to finish things off then, uh, combining the two scores, two and a half and four, to give the overall final score for the podcast, that gives us an average score of 3.25 out of five stars. So pretty good. I mean, it's on the positive side. It's definitely above the uh, middle yeah. of the road. So awesome. Uh, right then. So just to uh, to finish us off here again, the last section is our audience interaction. And it's the section that I call subspace communications. Incoming transmission. I wanted to start this particular one with a couple of um, audience interactions that are from just uh, places that I found from people that I don't know personally. But the first one is a 2015 retrospective by Keith Aria de Candido, who's a well-known kind of a fan and author. Uh, he found this episode disappointing for the original series and ranked it 4 out of 10. He thought the concept was decent but felt that the tone was not fitting. Various extreme events happen in the episode, like billions of Malurians killed off screen, Scotty being killed and resurrected, Uhura having memories wiped, and four security officers killed. Yet the characters don't seem to grapple with this. The crew has their normal banter and are oddly blasé about the situation, and the episode closes with a joke from Kirk. He also disliked the episode, leaving unexplained how Uhura was restored. So there you go. Uh, conversely, in 2016, Time magazine named Nomad the franchise's third best villain. The same year, CNET included Nomad as one of 26 powerful spacecraft of the Star Trek franchise. And also in 2016, Sci-Fi, the channel, noted Nichelle Nichols' performance as Uhura, writing that this, this episode included her ninth best scene in all of Star Trek. So there we go. Uh, that was a couple of more famous uh, inputs, but I did also put the usual social media message to my Twitter and say, what are everyone's thoughts on uh, the episode The Changeling from TOS? And I had about half a dozen, I think, responses. So if you bear with me, I'll just quickly whip through them. Um, at Derry underscore man one says, it was the first science fiction show that showed that the future offered not only advances in technology, but also the possibility of advances in education. The Enterprise crew were able to educate her at a college level in a matter of days. Not sure if you're being uh, ironic or sarcastic there, because it doesn't seem a lot of sense, but okay. Um, at first flight pod uh, via Melanie from that pod, hello, uh, says one of my all-time favorites with the exception of the Uhura concept. So much fantastic stuff going on here. Sterilize. <laughs> Thanks, Melanie. That's <laughs> cool. Um, John at Ice Tombs of Telos says, yes, the relearning part is the most blatant example of all back to normal by the next episode. These days, it would probably be a whole subplot through a number of episodes, but not in the days of standalone storytelling. That's probably fair enough. Um, at First Flight Pod chimed in again. I assume a different person this time, but we don't have a name. Uh, just to say, not enough space to elaborate. Amazing episode. The initial attack by Nomad and communications is so well done. Mind meld with Spock, well ordered. The unit Scott, Kirk's brilliant way out, outsmarting Nomad. Down to the wire nail-biting ending. Stakes so high and great production design. 
fair enough. I think it's a, probably a favourite of First Flight Podcast as well, and they'd probably be on your side with that one, Rick. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think saying it very much the same way I am, I think. Yeah, that's fair enough. Cool. Um, at WB Morton 84 says, A probe from Earth's past returns, having destroyed life on other planets. On the Enterprise, Nomad kills Scotty, brings him back, wipes Uhura's mind, sees Kirk as the creator and sets course for Earth. It's aimed to wipe out all biological life. In some way, like the motion picture. <laughs> Yeah, I think we've established that one, really. Um, <laughs> at Mork and Zindi, brilliant username, says, um, OK, it's my favourite original series and episode. It's the entire show in microcosm. Don't know anything about TOS. Watch this episode. It's got it all, but the whole we can re-educate Uhura in a day, so that's fine then. It's weird and very icky. <laughs> and uh, that was it. That was the last bit of uh, feedback that I had. So, yeah, thanks for that one, Mork and Zindi. <laughs> Name. I like that. Isn't it? Uh, awesome. Uh, right, so that'll conclude uh, this episode then. So just remains for me to say thank you so much for joining me. I always get carried away talking track with you because we both uh, clearly have a passion for the subjects. Yes. No, thanks for having That's me great. back on. It's been good fun. No problem. I'll definitely uh, have to do it again if you're keen because uh, it's always a great Absolutely. conversation. So yeah. awesome. And uh, just quickly, did you have anything you wanted to plug? This is your chance to plug uh, your podcast and your socials, etc. Uh, yeah, well, if you want to catch up with me on Twitter, I'm always happy to talk some Star Trek on there. I'm at TrekFanRick, um, and obviously I'm talking a lot of Star Trek over on 10 Backward, which you can find at 10 Backward on Twitter as well, um, yeah. where I just chat Star Trek for, um, every couple of weeks in an episode of that. Awesome. Yeah, it's a good podcast, and uh, Rick is a good follow on Twitter, whether he is uh, sheer Ricking Hubris or Secret Chalice of Ricks. <laughs> Both <laughs> great names. So, uh Awesome. Yeah, you can find me, as I say, I'm at Ian Mike Wilson personally on Twitter or just my name most other places. The podcast is at HOM Trek or Home Trek on Twitter or Hit or Miss Star Trek on Instagram and throughout uh, the internet world. And uh, yeah, that's uh, going to conclude things for this week. Next week, uh, do join us. I am joined by another returning guest, Julianne, uh, and we are going to be reviewing the Star Trek Picard episode, Stardust City Rag. So kind of a return to the Borg theme. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, right then. So just thanks again for joining me, Rick. It's been a really a real pleasure again. And uh, yeah, take care. Have a great day, everyone. And uh, remember, we are Starfleet. Live long and prosper. Live long and prosper. <laughs>